I am going to record this too, Don, so we can, oh, you can't hear me. It is what it is. Yeah. I'm going to record this too, so we will have it for everybody later. Let's see if the screen share is working. So what's going on over in Donland then? What's going on over in that side of town? What's going on over here? Yeah. I mean, I don't really know. It's a beautiful day. I'm excited about that. Right. And got to enjoy the sun today. Well, based upon the lighting on your face, it looks like you did not get any real color. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. I did. I promise you I did. You just can't see it. Mm, okay. <laughs> I have to believe you. That's yeah. Funny. Yeah, I went over and tinkered, tinkered around with a with a carburetor, and I learned that I don't know anything about a carburetor. I just oh. know I can make it worse, apparently. What's a carburetor? There you go. That's where I was at in the beginning of the day. It's a carburetor is so on an engine. There's the thing that there's now they're all um, they're all um, fuel injected, basically like non carbureted engines. The old school ones, like those muscle cars, those things are all carbureted. <laughs> Whose car was that? Was it yours? It was a boat. Oh, yeah, your boat. Everybody said has a boat now. I have a boat now, but it's only touched the water one time. And everybody says, don't, don't buy a boat because you know, I'm having to pay more money. But I refuse to pay more money right now. I'm just messing with it myself. That's fun. Yeah. I'm trying to figure it out on your own. Yeah, I definitely learned a lot today. And I learned that I'm going to know that engine bay inside and out for good or for worse. For gooder? Did you say gooder? Or for good, for good or for, ba for, for bad or for <laughs> good or bad. Okay, everybody. So we're one. Still to have a couple people file in because people tend to get a few minutes in and I want to make sure that they get the, beginning tidbits because it's pretty critical. Again, is anybody, uh, anybody new that care um, on the bottom? Do you hear me, Don? Yeah, your, your audio changed differently, but I can hear you. Oh, oh, should I just, I should podcast mic it then. Do it. Uh, it's okay. You're gonna yeah. really make me look bad. <laughs> this, this thing must have died on me. So, um, yeah, so, Everybody, um, get, get familiar with the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A, there's um, chat are the main ones that we're gonna use here. Um, we're gonna ask everybody to, you can ask questions at any point in time. We might not answer them immediately, but we're just certainly gonna answer them in order of, their, of them being received later on. Um, no questions too bad or too good. And I guarantee that if you have the same, if you have a question, someone else is gonna have the same question too. Um, and I guess I mean this in a nice way. If you ask us the same question later on social media, we won't answer it as thoroughly. So now is the time to answer any, ask any questions. We got that. Uh, We're starting? We're doing this? Uh, let's do it. Let's do 604. Okay. Sure. <laughs> so carburetors huh carburetors are a big deal that's cool though well i wonder if you're gonna be able to get your boat out on the water anytime soon hopefully right well isn't that the best way to quarantine yourself is being in the middle of a lake i mean i wouldn't argue with that but some people probably would well, they'd be arguing from the shoreline because I wouldn't be able to hear them. Apparently, they're not letting you. <laughs> they're not letting you actually get on the lake from some places. Okay. Where's the first place you're going to take it? Oh. Sure. Uh, it might be a putt putt lake, just to make sure the engine is good. Lake Skinner. You can catch striped bass. There you go. Sounds fun. Ready? Sure. Okay. Let's do it. All right, y'all. So thanks for uh, listening to us chit chat for a little while. We're waiting for everybody to kind of shrinkle in, but it looks like we're going to get started now.
Um, so welcome to the low back pain webinar. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to do this webinar is because we realized that with the times that we're in right now and people are suffering from low back pain, um, they either don't want to or are just hesitant to go to the doctor's office or the hospitals right now. And so um, we wanted to offer, or we wanted to help minimize exposure by offering virtual help through this webinar, as well as sharing with you how we conti can continue to help you long after this webinar is over. Uh, we will share with you just some knowledge about what we find to be the most common causes of low back pain, because sometimes the unknown can be a little bit scary. And the internet sometimes can give you some pretty overwhelming information. Um, with this, we will go over just some referred pain, explaining to you what this is and how it can relate to what you are experiencing. Uh, we will go over other causes of low back pain that we don't see as often or actually pretty rarely. Uh, we will progress into what you all came for, which is the movements that should help you decrease pain. And then we will get into our five steps of recovery uh, that we will utilize with people and or that we utilize with people and the ways that we can continue to help you on this journey to pain free movement. Go ahead and go next. And so reiterate, reiterate one more time, Q and A at the bottom. No questions too bad or too good. Yeah, that's so I think expectations uh, that people have sometimes of actually recovering from their pain are actually a little bit skewed. And I think that was probably the fault of um, a lot of us have had bad care. I've had bad care. Um, and also I've had, I would like to call it, um, let's call it non-eventful care. It wasn't bad. It was just not right for me. And I remember when I was 15 years old, I had, um, I had four months of low back, actually four months of rehab. I had one month of low back pain and I was taken away out of baseball. And so I didn't play baseball for four months. I felt better and I went back in literally first game, first at bat, first swing. I was the first bat of the whole game. Down on the ground again, could, could not swing again. And so it's, it was very frustrating. But um, I think an important part here is that if we realize what good expectations are, if you find the right plan, then it'll maybe give you guys some hope. Um, if you find the right plan and whatever, whatever that might be, maybe it is stretching, maybe it is adjusting, maybe it is uh, medication, whatever it might be, you should have a 50% reduction roughly within one or two weeks. I know it seems like a lot, but it's actually very, it's fairly accurate of what we've seen. Now, I don't want you to confuse restoration of function with reduction of pain. They're different. And kind of how I mentioned there too, is I had about a month of pain. Pain went away. It was gone for three months but I didn't have a restoration of function of what my goal was, which was to swing a baseball bat. So very easy to get people out of pain, but it's harder to keep them out of it, especially if we don't have their goals in mind. Um, so if you've been, if you've tried a lot of things so far, um, you probably have been very frustrated. And I made this little word thing up here uh, recently and I thought, Hey, this would be kind of cool. But now I'm looking at the screen. I'm like, I don't know what to say about this thing. There's a lot going on, but I do know that the big thing is a lot of people end up, yeah, I thought it was cool when I made it. Um, I think the cool the thing is that a lot of people do feel lost and defeated and they feel like they're giving up and then they've tried everything. And, and this goes for various different things for hamstring strains, hip flexors, you know, and so on. And they've tried things like hip mobility and um, stretching routines and so on. And these are the things that are very frustrating about it is that people feel like they've tried a lot and just know that you're not alone in this. Just is probably the most common. Uh, this is very common for people to feel this way. I know that I did. All right. So we are going to get into just explaining a little bit about what referred pain is and how this can um, kind of contribute to what maybe you guys are experiencing as well. Um, so referred pain is just pain that is felt somewhere in the body and it's a source is located somewhere else. Um, so we use an extreme example of a heart attack to help you all conceptualize this. Um, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with people who are experiencing a heart attack, describe what they feel as like tightness in the chest or mid back or neck, um, or even down into the left arm. That's one of the main things is left arm achiness or pain. And so uh, this is a prime example of what the heart being the, uh, as a source of pain located in the chest and then it refers down into the left arm somewhere away from where the uh, actual cause of it is coming from. And so for us to know that the heart is the source of pain, we have to gather more data. It's important for us to gather uh, data because how do we know like this, this left arm pain is coming from the heart? Is it coming from the neck? Is it coming from something in the arm? We don't know unless we gather more data. 
So the, one of the things that we want to know is, is this person with left arm pain also having nausea, indigestion, heartburn, abdominal pain? Um, are they experiencing shortness of breath, cold sweats, fatigue, lightheadedness? These are all just critical data points that we need to gather along with that left arm pain for us to figure out where that source of pain is coming from. So although the heart is the source, sometimes we feel it elsewhere in the body. And so to rule, um, actually go ahead and step, go to the next one for me, please. One thing, I had a little audio glitch there. Everyone raise your hand if you heard everything that Don said in that. I can't see them, Don. Everything good? Um, I don't know how to look and see oh, people raising I, their hands. Oh, they are, good, cool, got it. We're good, that was just my end, sorry. Okay, um, just another slightly extreme example of referred pain continuing on. Um, is kidney stones. So your kidneys are located just below your rib cage and can refer to the low back, can refer to the abdomen, and can refer to the groin area. I actually experienced this once myself. Um, I had a kidney infection, and all I was experiencing with this kidney infection was low back pain. Um, one of the things that we noticed was with this low back pain, I couldn't necessarily find a position of comfort. No amount of adjusting soft tissue, whatever type of conservative treatment I was doing, wasn't helping with this pain. And so although it was the kidneys that was the source of pain, I was refer it was referring elsewhere. People can also experience it referring into different parts of the body. So critical data points that we would gather with this would also be pain while urinating, blood in the urine, sharp pain in the back or abdomen, and nausea and vomiting. These are all critical data points that we would gather along with that pain to try to help us cue in on what is the source of pain that we are feeling. This one, me? Sure. So referred pain, is, the reason why we're bringing up all these weird types of systemic heart, kidney referred pain is because I know that a lot of people, we do know a lot of people like search right-sided low back pain, what's the reason? It's like, just because it hurts to bend forward is not the only data point that you need to figure out why this is going on and what you need to do to get rid of it. In the case of the kidney stones, sure, you have back pain, but there's all these other data points which help out to find out the reason and the way, the quick way, again, for one or two weeks to get rid of the actual problem that you're want, that you're wondering about. And so these are actually, if you look up things like referred pain patterns, um, you'll see that there's various different distributions based upon the red. If you look at the left side, the X is the area where they injected an irritant into somebody's uh, probably glute max or something. And this is the, what everybody said. All the data points reflect what people have said. And so maybe there's an, uh, an irritation with the musculature in the area. In the, right, in the middle one, it's somebody who had it in their glute med. And then the other one is just other things too. There's all these, there's all these things that seem very, it, it's like, well, yeah, this could be the SI joint, but something's referring there. And I'm not saying that muscle is the only thing that will be the reason for these problems, but certainly don't take the region of pain as being the only indicator of how to get rid of it. With things like DISC, which are actually, if we were to, if we were to take a, a, rough, a rough spread of percentages of people who come into our office and say, hey, I got back pain, I'd say well over half of them are DISC patients, um, meaning they have a DISC irritation of some degree. There's various different degrees. Um, it's, we have it so much that actually I have a model in case someone asked the question. Um, and they're actually very easy to treat in most cases when their herniations, not prolapses, prolapses are larger. But some critical data points on this are worse in the morning, usually the first 30 minutes or so, kind of rolling out of bed is like, oh, that's not good. Sometimes the first step out of bed is not good. Once you start, eventually start walking, it starts to settle itself out prolonged sitting to the standing position, meaning you're sitting for like 20 minutes and then you uh, try to get up. That's not good. I remember there, I remember there was a, a guy that I had, had met before that he's like, you know how I know it's my hip flexors because they're always, because they're in a shortened position. And when I stand up, they've been shortened. So they won't let go. And I'm like, ah, it sounds like a disc to me. So bending over, washing dishes, deadlifting, back squatting, um, uh, coughing, sneezing, going number two, we call, um, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a pretty classic of DISC, by the way. Um, twisting, exiting cars and beds. Notice on the left, there's a large, um, this, this, this distribution pattern, it's a little bit, it was a little bit hard to find a clean one for you guys to look at. But, you, but notice how there's, there's referral into the hip area and the thigh. Um, if it goes beyond the knee, we're looking at the next thing typically, which is nerve-referred pain. 
disc will usually be above the knee, nerve will be below it, but sometimes a disc will affect a nerve, or you can have a nerve primarily creating a problem via just some pinching. Again, I underlined below the knee, meaning that if you feel like you have a muscle spasm, you're like, oh, it's the muscle spasm it, it's going below the knee, it's not. It's, it's going to be probably this, especially when correlated with things like change of skin sensation, prickly, numbness, aching into the arch of the foot, the bottom of the heel starts to become tight, the, the calf muscles or the soleus seem like they're always tight and the hamstring just won't ever let go. These things are usually nerve referred and when a nerve, and the nerve is an electrical impulse to, an air, to a muscle and it will tell a muscle, please get tighter. And that's why a lot of times in these types of cases, stretching sometimes makes it worse because you're not just necessarily stretching a muscle, you're also stretching a nerve. Nerves that are irritated don't like being stretched and they're gonna tell you about it. And so pain is a way to kind of figure out what's going on here. But usually, notice these data points too. Bending over increases such as touching toes and poor lifting. The disc was the same thing, you know, and twisting, exiting, uh, exiting a car or exiting it out of bed. Disc was the same thing, but usually this one won't have coughing or sneezing. And I don't mean to confuse you guys, but this is why gathering the data is actually pretty important because if we treat someone like a nerve versus a disc, um, they, they might have wishy-washy experiences if we do the wrong thing. Um, and actually, sometimes they get a little worse if you treat it the wrong way. The facet joints, sometimes known as the facet joints, well, uh, Don likes to call these, what do you call these? They're facets. The faucet. Okay, it's not my fault. It's whatever professor taught me how to say it that way in school, all right? <laughs> not this in French or something. But <laughs> so, yeah, the facet joints, here's some referral patterns um, based upon one of the articles that I saw. Notice that, so the facet joints, um, they're actually the small little muscles in the, in the part of the back that uh, I'll, oops, um, I'll, I'll just put this up to the screen here real quick so you guys can just take a look and see. Um, it's these little things right in there. I know I'm not very big in your guys' screen, but it's the stuff in the back. There's, a, there's like a bazillion of them almost. And they can refer to other parts too. Um, not just where the joint is, because the joint's a very small location. Usually it's gradual onset. More times it's, it's um, um, it, can, it can refer to the glute or groin area. So it usually gets worse with bending backwards and rotating. Um, and sometimes people have really bad facet Ir, uh, ir, regional issues where they actually have fractures, and this goes along with younger uh, athletes. Um, always get your young kids screened appropriately because they might have a fracture and someone just has not tested them for it. Um, uh, butt out usually increases it type of positions, and it can be within multiple joints, and it's usually worse at the end of the day after standing or walking too much. Um, this one, I'll cover this one very briefly. The reason why we put all these things on here is because a lot of you think you might have discs, some think you have nerves, some think you have facet, some think you have SI joint, um, and some think you have muscle. And so SI joint, I'll tell you right now, I think in 10 years of practice, I've seen one, one true one. They're not very, they're not very common, although pain in the area is very common. And if you, chase that, if you chase that thing, you won't feel better very quickly. You won't comply with the one to two week timeline. Usually split squatting or walking will bother this more so, or maybe standing on one leg. Um, I actually talked to a friend about this. I said, what do you think one would look like? He's like, shoot, I barely seen one either. It's hard to remember the history of these things, um, but a lot of people will have some of the similar data points as the other ones as well. The last thing is muscle trigger points. This is a big topic for a lot of people. I brought up the extreme version because I think it's important to realize what the, what the possibilities are. If you really had a muscular injury, one that will be found on an MRI or an ultrasound, you will have bruising. That is one of the literal criteria for finding a positive image. If you do not have bruising and you do not have a positive image, you have what we call, if it was an muscular injury, it was called a quote unquote strain. Strains get better, which is a cool thing. Grade two tears, such as this, this guy probably ruptured something. He's probably a grade three. They, they have something we call fiber disruption which is what's found on the MRI because you visually see a problem. When you tear something, like I remember I cut my finger, there was no position I could get into that ever felt better. And so you won't find a position of comfort if you actually tore something and you won't even find fluctuations. Everything's going to hurt. But the cool thing is most of these self-resolve within 10 days. Um, now trigger points, I, I might be going out on a limb here, but um, 
I don't know if they actually exist. I, I'll say that I, I'll probably get criticism for it. Um, I know it hurts in the area, but I don't know if they actually exist. I think it's just the areas, the muscles or the, the nerves being told to become tight. And that's what feels like a muscle balls up into a knot. Um, based upon the percentages again, especially with low backs, if we're talking disc, and I'm, these are basic numbers, rough numbers, disc, let's say 45%, nerve, 25%, facet, like another 15, 25%, SI, God, I'm going to say under five, muscle, maybe 10. I hope those numbers add up, but there, there's not a lot of them. And so if you guys are chasing this and it hasn't produced any fruit for your treatment, you probably are assuming you have the wrong thing. That's why it's not improving. Go ahead. Nicely done. Very passionate. Mm -hmm. That's I go. We're going to move now, guys. It's time to move. Uh, so one thing I want you guys to note before we do anything is that me and Seb, we cannot see you. So everything that you're doing, you're doing on your own. Put the laptop in a position where you can see Seb's screen. So if you see me because I'm talking and it pops me up because I'm talking or whatever device you're using for Zoom, whatever it's doing, Put yourself so you can see Seb and also the screen that he's sharing because I'm going to take him through the movements that I want you guys to do. Well, so I, first, go ahead. One thing too, I guess we didn't do it. Um, we always got to have the disclaimer. This is, uh, we are not seeing you as doctors right now. Okay. So if you guys don't feel comfortable doing this stuff, just don't like you don't have to. Um, and just know that if you really want to be evaluated, you have to go to a doctor. All right. This is just for educational purposes. Perfect. Okay. So First thing we are doing is we are getting up, we are standing up, and we are moving around. If we want to, we want to just kind of take note of what our body is feeling like right now. If I go down and touch my toes, what does it feel like? Just go down nice and slow, nice and safely to wherever you're comfortable. There we go. Throwing me off, Seb. <laughs> Sorry. I really okay, better. <laughs> That's true. That does work. Okay, now they can definitely see you. Okay. So just go down, touch your toes for me. Note how your back is feeling. Note how whatever else you're feeling comes on when you're doing that. Just take note of how it feels. Describe it to yourself. Note the intensity of it. Lean backwards for me. Go into a backwards bend. Take note of what that feels like. Go side to side rotation. One thing that some of you may have is you may have a specific movement that you know creates your low back pain. Like if I do this one thing, it's going to create my low back pain for sure. So I want you to do that thing right now. Not necessarily to like aggravate your symptoms, but just to take note of how you're feeling right now. So Seb's going to pick maybe a squat that hurts my back. I'm going to note it. Cool. So first thing we're going to do is the first exercise. We're going to go through a few different ones. And if this first one, actually, because we're going to retest that movement that you know caused pain or how your body felt right now, we're going to retest it after this. If it actually reduces your pain, we don't want you to go on to the next one. So this is just the first one that we're going into. So you're going to go on the ground and you're going to lay on your stomach and prop yourself up on your elbows like you're reading a book. Just like that. And so Seb is just relaxing his glutes and relaxing his low back into the ground. And he's thinking about breathing. Anytime he takes a deep, deep breath in, he's breathing into his belly and pushing his belly into the ground. And we're just relaxing into this extended position. It may be a little uncomfortable at first for some of you. If it does increase in pain or if your pain starts to travel away from the low back or away from the spine, down the leg or into the glutes, this is not the movement for you. If you feel okay in this position, we're going to progress you forward. And what we're going to do is, if you can see Seb, he's getting himself ready. We're just going to do what we call like a crappy push-up. So he's going to come up and even to a more extended position, extend his elbows all the way through, relaxing his belt buckle to the ground, and then relaxing back down. We're going to try to get in about 20 repetitions of these. So I'm just going to talk, and Seb's going to do the movement. The rest of you are going to do the movement. And one thing that we start to notice with people as they're doing this is they have trouble sometimes relaxing their glutes or relaxing their low back muscles in that movement. And so if you don't know if you're doing this, Seb is doing an, a, a different way of trying to perform the specific movement. And he's going up into tabletop position on his hands and knees and then just bringing the belt buckle down to the ground, relaxing into that position there and then coming back up and we're repping through these. I want you guys to just continue to do these until you reach about 20 of them. Taking note of what it is feeling like. You may start to notice the more you do, the further you can go into the movement. 
Some of you may not even really have had pain in the first place. That's okay. Just take note of this pain. You want to add anything, Seb? <clears throat> um, no, I don't think so. It's a, um, some, or sometimes it'll feel a little bit like pinchy, like right in here for some people. Um, if, if that is the case, usually we'll just have them kind of go here and then, and then sink back into a little bit of a breathing, which we're going to do in a second here anyways. Um, but it's, it's normal to feel that. Um, as long as it isn't travel, um, it's kind of like if your arm's been in a cast for a while and you're just trying to extend it, it's going to feel a little bit binding, but it, it shouldn't last. It should be gone right when you're done. Cool. I think at this point, people probably should have reached about 20 at this point. Nope. Um, so we are going to get up and move again. Do all the same movements that you noticed or that we did before. Touch the toes, bend backwards. Do your provocative movement, whether it was a squat, whether it was whatever it was that you know was causing your pain, just retest. And what we're looking for is a 30% improvement, improvement in either pain intensity or improvement in range of motion. Say you couldn't really get down into the squat very deep, now you could get a little bit further before that pain returns in your low back. This is something that we're looking for. This is still an improvement in such a short amount of time. <clears throat> cool. If you either didn't perform this one because you weren't comfortable with it or eh, you know what I didn't have very much improvement at all after those 20 repetitions we're going to go on to number two uh, number two there's going to be two different ones that we're going to do let me so I'm going to start you off in the frog one because I'm going to give people time to go grab a chair if they need it <laughs> I feel like we always jump into that too quickly yeah. so if you guys have a chair near you Grab it, bring it towards you. We're gonna need it for the next one. But I'm going to take Seb through, what do you call this one again? Just frog position? Frog breathing, I guess. Yeah. I think it's just frog position. I don't know if you're freezing on everybody's, but oh, there he is, he's in a frog position. Okay, so we start at tabletop position and we're just gonna sit our butt back towards our heels. You can spread your knees as far away from each other, as close together as you need to for your hip comfort. And he's propping himself onto his elbows and he's just relaxing his head into his hands. This should be a pretty comfortable position for some of you. I feel like there's a lot of freezing going on. I hope that everybody can hear me okay. In this position, what you're focusing on is breathing into your belly, breathing into your pockets of your pants, breathing into the tops of the thighs. This is pretty much all we're focusing on in this position. You'll notice that Seb isn't very rounded in his low back at all. This is pretty much just putting yourself into a nice comforting position to open up the low back and open up the spinal column. And we're gonna try to hold for about a minute or so. And so after about a minute, and again, Focusing on, is my intensity increasing? If so, this is not the movement for you. In this position, we just want to hold. So the, the purpose of this is, can we put you in a position that your pain begins to reduce? Can we put you in a comfortable position at all that allows your back pain to subside? Do you want to add anything to that, Seb? No, I think I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll touch on a couple. Uh, you, you cut out a couple times, I think, on my end. Um, yeah, if you, like, the cool thing is we want to see people with fluctuations. So when there's fluctuations, there's really easy wins in, in the in in store. And so uh, this is what we call a position of comfort. It's just comfortable. You know, it should feel like it's not doing anything. And this actually works for a lot of people, but a lot of people tend to search for a stretch or an effortful exercise. And it doesn't it, it doesn't always take that. It's just something easy. And the body's not dumb, it just says please stop hurting me and let me find that position of comfort more. Got it? Don, you ready? Cool. Okay. You want to go into that? Uh, or do you want to move an on that thing? So am I freezing? Yeah, you're freezing a little bit. Um, while Don is not freezing, I'll keep talking. Everyone, can you raise your hand if you hear me? Cool. All right, put your hand down. <laughs> Can't raise your hand if you hear Don pretty well. No, oh, there's less hands there. Okay, so then um, 
Don, once you, you're, since you're glitching a little bit, uh, I'll take over here for a moment. And so we're going to do one where it's, it's called 90-90 breathing. And so all I'm going to do here is I'm going to find a chair. The chair is really just to put the legs up. You can use other things. You can use a wall. Um, but it should, it should just feel like a nice, comfortable position. Um, and for a lot of people, this is actually a very comfortable position. We call it the rescue position. And so the knees are a little bit up hips slightly again finding a position that's comfortable and you just put the hands fingertips into the belt area and just breathe deep into them okay you should feel the pads of the fingers start to expand a little bit as you take deep breaths if you want to advance it a little bit you push with about five pounds of pressure into your heels so your tailbone slightly rolls up now I'll caution you, some people, again, movements, certain movements aren't beneficial to them. And so we would then take this away. Um, cannot see you. Okay, what's going on here? Can I, raise your hand if you can see me. Everybody raise. Okay, so there's hands going up. Um, cool, all right. So I think, uh, let's see, Gloria, there might be a little, I'm not sure where that's at, but. Um, everybody, I think from now on then, if there's a technical issue, since apparently everybody in the world is using Zoom now, um, raise your hand and we'll start to see them come up and, and we'll, we'll tangent a little bit. Don, I don't see you moving at all. Don, why don't you log out and log back in again? I'll continue. So, all right, everybody keep doing that. So it's going to be about a minute's worth of this effort. Again, breathing should be through the fingertips. And if you want to push the heels through the table or the chair a little bit, it just should kind of like roll your tailbone up. Again, this movement sometimes bothers some people because their backs can't tolerate rounding. Um, if that is the case, then we just don't do it in lieu of doing a different first aid or a reset. All right. Resets are pretty simple. They should feel normal. They should feel pain-free and they should feel comfortable. So um, everybody, now what I want you to do is just go to move around again. We're in that move around thing. And move to the, um, try that position and movement that your body didn't really love before and see if there was a change. If there was a change, again, of 30% or more, all it means is this could be helpful. It could be very helpful. Um, and it could be a super easy win if you just follow what's working with you now. Um, the, the thing is, again, a lot of people end up um, not find, they, actually my experience, a lot of people end up finding, they find these easy wins on their own because their body is pretty, oh, I think I am freezing now. Am I freezing? Guys, raise your hand if you can't see me. Raise your hand if you can see me and you can hear me. Okay, cool, I'll keep going. So, um, everybody, uh, so yeah, people, the body's not stupid. It kind of knows, like, I like to, I like to compare this to a limp. If you limp and, uh, it takes pressure off of your leg, that's actually a good thing until you limped too long, too far, too often. So, um, but limping is certainly not a bad thing if that's what your body's looking for to not hurt itself and to chill itself down. You just have to allow the limp to happen for five to 10 days, and then you eventually put weight on it, and you're off, and you're good to go. So um, now with this, let me uh, make sure that, let's see where Don's at here. Don, are you in the panelist list? There you are. I'm going to allow you to talk again. All right, let's see. Sorry, guys. This is, uh, we didn't have this issue last time. So Don, you are talkable, and now you're a panelist. Come back in and join us. Um, so um, I like to call this the five true steps to recovery because um, what people don't always understand, I've noticed, is they, they figure that there's a couple easy steps to get out of pain, they say. Um, and then uh, they, they, don't, they don't realize there's other parts to it. Don, do you see me okay? Don? Audio, your audio is off on the left. There you go. Hi. Okay. So, Are you sharing your screen? Because I can't see your screen. I'm going to do it right there now. Go. Cool. So, um, yeah, so not everyone un tends to understand that there's extra steps that are involved. And I like to compare it to 
like an airplane. All right. It's really not, it's, it's not hard to stay out of, or off the ground once you're off the ground, but it's really hard to catch steam and, and start going. And so when, when people are, are in like steps two and step three, which is where a lot of the rehab ends up being like, we, like we usually go over on day one, we go over step one, which is history and examination and diagnosis and first aids and all that kind of stuff, which is really quick. But certainly if people stay and do only that, their problem will come back. Um, step three is like when you see in a rehab clinic, it's like balls and bands and stuff on the ground and that's okay. But if you only do that, you will, I believe this will still come back. When you start experiencing things like navigating loads throughout life, such so as strength training um, and actually encountering uh, um, um, sports, not necessarily like aggressive sports, but ones where, um, you know, you just move around chasing squirrels, you know, kicking balls and stuff. You, this is kind of where people most of the time want to be and they're scared to be because it's scary to do those movements again. Um, building a bumper is an analogy I used to use. Again, I don't think I'm going to stop using that now. Um, and I like the airplane. All right. It's going to be very challenging to get off the ground, but once you get off the ground, it's really not going to be that hard. Don, do you want to take this one or is this my slide? That's you. Okay. Can you see me anymore? I can see you. Okay, good. So, oh, hands raising. Thank you, guys. Um, so how do you build a bumper? First off, know that motion is lotion and movement is medicine. I know they're fancy slang terms now, but it really is helpful. We find a lot of people with back pain that simply walking makes their back pain feel better while stagnant sitting doesn't help. Movement is helpful, except when it's not helpful. And Im imagine that limp I talked about. If you try to put pressure too quickly on a, on a broken ankle, this is not a good thing. And there's a point in time where your body is really good at navigating you through what to do and what not to do. If you listen to pain as pain as an asset, pain can be your asset and guide you in what to do. You just have to pay attention a little bit better and be guided a little bit. Um, now, it's important to realize too that actually if you become, uh, if you rest too long, you will probably become fragile, weak, and scared of movement. It's natural. We've seen a lot of people with it. I know that when I had back pain, I didn't want to do certain things. Um, I never really did prolonged bed rest or just like not doing anything. But what happens when you rest too long is your muscles become tight. They become weaker. Your body becomes um, non-resilient and basically more fragile and unsupported. And it's just how it goes. It's like when you have your uh, your leg in a cast and you start, and you don't walk on it for a while, you're, you're, when your leg comes out of the cast, your muscles are naturally smaller, all right? It happens because you're not using them. And so it's harder to dig yourself out of that hole when you do much, too much rest. Third is make sure you figure out what your body likes and doesn't like. Some things like stepping on a broken ankle is not what your body likes right now, but it doesn't mean it won't like it forever. And so figuring out what your body likes and doesn't likes is really the key in, in figuring out what to do. Because most people can feel better with just movement-based medications, and they don't even need a lot of hands-on tissue work and, and things of that nature, although they are helpful things to decrease pain, but they don't, they're not always needed in most cases. And the last thing is a lot of times you just need someone to help guide you. And I know that um, we've spoken to a lot of people um, about, hey, do you just want to do, like, why don't you just go onto our site and figure out what to do? Because there's a lot of free stuff on there. Like, mm, can you just tell me? You know, because I think people want to know that they're doing the right thing. And that's not wrong. I know that when I hurt my back the second time, I just wanted a friend to tell me what to do. I didn't want to think about it. Although I knew what I could do, I just wanted him to guide me. It was much easier and it was easier to pay for it. Don. Cool. Um, so I just think that one of the things that we want to emphasize is that, that if these exercises did you give you just some relief, then it's the perfect sign that our next approach can help you. It can help you continue to improve and prevent days where you're having recurring pain. We have put together uh, an online program through an app that is designed just to specifically help you with um, those wanting to be more active and integrate physical activity into their lives while working around this pain. So with these uh, programs, what you'll have is just daily and weekly plan of attack, um, which is just access to videos that we've recorded and that will help educate you and then just exercises that you can follow 
There's the step-by-step -step instructions and ways to track your progress and exercises throughout the day. There's an option to even have access to us with questions that you may have as far as just form or am I doing this right or hey, this is causing pain, do you have something different? Um, we are confident that we, you, that we don't need to be with you in person for you to feel better. Um, our treatment approach in office in person is really a hands-off approach anyways. A lot of times what we're doing is just taking people through these exercises that we have in this program already installed for you. Um, so you don't necessarily need manual treatment to get better. And there are a variety of even just, um, just payment options as well if you guys wanna discuss that. And so what we're offering, go ahead and go to the next slide, Seb. What we're offering for you guys is a huge discount. Normally a telemedicine or even just a video chat session with us would be 275. Any of you that have hopped on this webinar with us today about your low back pain, we are going to offer you a $50 video call with us. What this video call will consist of is just a movement assessment, basically what we did before, but we're just gonna watch you do what you're doing and kind of take you through some of these movements and see, brainstorm with you, you know, what does your body need? What exactly is your bumper or the exercise that's gonna help you with this pain? And then we could talk about the programs and the price, um, the prices that we have to offer for you as well. And then this $50 in this video call will go towards any of the programs if you do decide to move forward with continuing with care through us. Um, so to take advantage of that, we are doing it only for the first 20 people who send us an email. Our email is info at p2sportscare.com. And please, in the subjects um, of that email, we want you to put low back webinar so that we can make sure that we don't miss it. We get a lot of emails throughout the day. And um, yeah, so take advantage of that if you guys want to move forward with it. And we're going to leave some time now for some question and answers. All right. What kind of question and answers we got so far? I don't, yeah, I don't see them now that I'm on my phone, so. Oh, I see some. Oh, you had a problem, did you? All right. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read, I'll read, I'll do the first one just because it's a longer one and because I don't guarantee, I might have to repeat it a couple times. Um, someone asked, uh, I find that when I try to gain flexibility through my lower back via a downward dog or a stretch or a similar stretch working on hamstrings, that it seems to aggravate it rather than loosen it up or increasing or uh, loosen it up or increase range of motion. I want to improve my lower back flexibility without irritating it. Actually, do you want that one? That's your call. You're a, you've done yoga. So. Um, I think with that one specifically, we kind of touched on that a little bit in earlier is just that sometimes stretching in the area where you're feeling tightness isn't necessarily what needs to be stretched. So what I think about with this specific movement and with the downward dog movement, a lot of us are rounding our back in that position, especially if we don't have the range of motion that we think we do. And so rounding in the low back could actually be causing more injury to the structures that we kind of took you through. And so stretching your hamstrings may be putting more tension on that nerve that's actually causing your pain. Or being in that downward dog motion is putting rounding in your low back and it's causing more pressure on the discs and more pressure on the nerves as we go forward. So a lot of times actually, if we take a step backwards and we start to focus on core stability, glute exercises, you'll start to notice as we calm the body down, we'll actually will improve our range of motion drastically by focusing on areas other than where necessarily where you're feeling the tightness. Does that answer the question, Seb? I think so. Um, I, I think too, like there's probably gonna be a few people asking things or thinking these things, you know, like um, I've tried this, I heard this word for a friend and uh, it's not working for me. Right, yes, like we agree. It's not, um, that's why we went over some of those data point things and what what typical expectations should be if you select the right thing. Now you can try things like, um, uh, I don't wanna say just only YouTube videos and so on, but um, you can try things that are just randomly selected or you can have someone select them for you, which would be a healthcare provider. Um, or if the healthcare provider um, doesn't select the right thing, which we haven't done, we, we don't select the right thing out every time, you will still not have the same, you won't have a good result. And so I guess my advice is, is that if you've done this for weeks on end and months on end and it's not getting better, I would stop doing that. I would do it and do something else. Um, you'd be surprised how yoga can help a lot of people, but also can make people feel worse depending upon what their problem is. Actually, sorry, I think <laughs> certainly in yoga because yoga has a lot of movements in it rather. 
I think one thing I want to add is if going into the downward dog position is one of your goals, we can work you towards that too. It just may not be the right thing for you right now. So we just need to calm the body down and let the brain and body know that this is a movement that you want to get yourself into. And we can show you that you can do that without pain as well. We just got to work towards it if that's your goal. Right, right. Oh, now I'm going to add one more on that then. Um, <laughs> when, sometimes when we work with people, what we tell them not to do on week one is different on within week two. Like say we would take this away for one week and have them do something else. And then the next week, if they prove that it doesn't bother them anymore, we integrate it back in. But just like limping, we endorse the limp and then take the limp away. Okay, answered that one. All right, we have another, which is um, common advice to maintain a straight back when lifting, etc. However, many yoga poses, etc., discourage being able to move in and out of a curve, uh, water -like, um, or curved waterfall-like lower back. I think we're talking about a lower back round with not dead or don't lower back round when when lifting but it's okay in yoga does that sound like what this is saying don i honestly i didn't really hear what the question was okay I was I'll, struggling with understanding that one that was my problem okay so here's here's what i how's I'm, I'm interpreting it and, and you can feel free to, to chime in again um if you want me to clarify if i don't answer it um so when when lifting a flat spine is is more useful and safer because of the load. And so it's important to realize that when you're, um, if you're lifting, you, you should have a quote unquote better form than you, are, than you would if you would, did, did something like a, a body weight movement like yoga. Like there's nothing wrong with bending over from the hips and the low back and rounding the low back as a normal human movement. Yet when you do it with a weight, especially with, um, uh, with a little bit of a twist involved, that's like a recipe for usually a disc. And that's the mechanics that we look for a lot of times on histories. Um, they're like, oh, I hurt my back deadlifting. Great, show us your deadlift. Oh, you're round. Got it. Like this sounds like a disc. You're acting like a disc. Then this is probably a disc. Now, um, it's when, when we consider what the spine is able to do, um, it's not it, always the right movements for the situation. Meaning if we wanted a flat back with lifting because it was useful with that task of lifting, um, it doesn't mean we're telling people that dance like ballerinas to also do that same thing. Yet if bending forward, the water like lower back was painful today for whoever it was, we would still remove it for a period of time and then we would reintroduce it based upon what your goals are. But if you don't like, and I don't mean this in a bad way, not everybody wants to do yoga. Not everybody wants to lift, but some people feel like they have to do them to feel better. And it's not true. And so if you like yoga and you want to do yoga, like Don said earlier, certainly you can go back to it once things settle, but don't feel like yoga is the only answer, nor is lifting, nor is stretching and so on. It's, it's been dependent upon what you want to do. Got it? Yeah, Don? yeah, absolutely. Okay, this next one's yours then. Um, can one ever expect to fully recover from a bulging or herniated disc? I'm a runner. That question, the way that I would answer that question is, yeah, absolutely. I think that it's learning how to manage it. It's the approach that we take is showing you and giving you the tools that you need to get yourself out of pain. So having, having recurrent episodes the amount of recurrent episodes that you're having can be reduced. Like it's, it's not abnormal for the pain to return. That's actually sometimes to be expected. It doesn't necessarily have to happen, but we're giving you all the tools that you need and the exercises that you need and building, building resilience for you to be able to deal with this on your own. If it does happen again, um, it doesn't need to be re debilitating recurrent episodes and things of that sort. And that's what we're trying to teach you. Um, but can you recover from a bulging disc? Absolutely, you can. It's learning how to manage the symptoms and learning how to decrease the pain on your own is what we're trying to focus on working on. Yeah. Can I, can I ask this one too? So, um, so I had, at 15 years old, I had back pain that was diagnosed disc herniation um, in the lower back. It was a three, three millimeter. It wasn't that big. Um, I had pain for, again, about a month and then no pain for three months. And then I hurt myself again. And I went back and got a um, good rehab. And I went back to play baseball. I still play. Um, 
I didn't have any pain after that for 20 years. And then I finally deadlifted. Uh, I was deadlifting anyways, but I deadlifted for a series of time and I hurt myself deadlifting and I'm like, oh crap, this sounds like probably bad form, bad form, rounded back, lots of weight. Okay, this is probably that again. And I actually got an MRI done and it was a three millimeter herniation, same spot, same level. And so it kind of like begs the question of, so I had 20 years of no pain. I was extremely active, but also I probably throughout my life, I probably had more pain for years with the herniation than I did with that, than I, um, than I actually had pain because I had pain for what, two months when I was 15 and I had what a couple months when I was 35, the same herniations there. It doesn't have to be active though. You might still see it on an image, but it's not always painful. And you can certainly be back. Most people can certainly be back to full activity. Usually human locomotion like running, walking are, are very attainable for most people. Nice. Uh, okay. So that one's answered. And how do, how do I know when my core is strong enough to support my back? You want to go first, Tom? How do I know when my core is strong enough to support my back? I think I think probably at, uh, asking the question of do we want do we need the core to be strong to have no back pain? Depends on what our thoughts of strong are as far as the core, right? Yeah, I think endurance is actually core endurance is more it's more uh, correlated, meaning holding a plank or side plank versus crunching 500 pounds. So usually, um, and I've, I've made this make mistake clinically before, I, I chase people into like this, okay, you got to be able to do a plank, a side plank for 90 seconds on both sides or else you're not going to be pain free. And so they, they got into the point where they could do it and they were still in pain. And the reason why I believe they still were in pain because we successfully got them out of that after, after that was because we missed step two. Step three is core endurance and things like that, which is if you remember that little pyramid thing. Uh, it, step two is first aid. It's easy stuff, easy stuff, but you got to chill the area down. Um, so I wouldn't focus on a number. I would focus on what helps because people can get better without planking, without uh, side planking and all this stuff. But it, it could help on some people, especially people who are deconditioned and just generally just kind of bed rest people. It'll help them more so than someone who's already active. I hope that helps. I think so. I think it's, yeah, it's about the way, the way you activate your core and how long you can hold that activation through those movements that you're talking about. That's the most important. It's not necessarily how strong we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Oh, we had a, a clarification on the, the chat or on, the, on the, the chat. So there was a question earlier about the downward dog. So we said, don't want to necessarily improve downward dog, just want lower back, more lower back flexibility. Actually, lower back flexibility is not extremely correlated to low back pain. Mm -hmm. I would work on the hips more so. And once the, say, say we're working on a nerve or something like that, once the nerve sensitivity goes down, your back is going to feel more flexible than it does today, and it won't even take that long. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't force it. If you force it, then you're going to have some lashback because some of the some of the inflexibility that you might be experiencing could be protective because your body says, "Please don't," you know, and and it's trying to protect itself. Uh, okay, my pain, my pain from my lower back is usually coupled with tightness in the hips after exercise. Do you suggest? How do you suggest I prevent this? on say that one more time my pain in my lower back is usually coupled with tightness in my hips um let's just say uh we'll, we'll need some clarification on the bottom chat um are you talking front or back of hips let's just let's just say back of hips right now don um oh front of hips in the groin got it so tightness in the front in the groin area do you have any suggestions about how to present prevent this uh, what are the exercises by the way if you don't mind putting those down I think where I want to start with that, and this is going to be different than probably what your answer is going to be, but sometimes I think to myself, this goes back to the question before, as far as like, there's certain areas of the body that need to be mobile and certain areas of the body that need to be stable. And sometimes when we don't have the mobility in our hips, which is maybe where that tightness feeling is coming from, we start to try to find that mobility through our low back. And then that's where the low back pain can come from or vice versa. 
is the low back pain, disc and nerves radiating and referring into the hip area. We can also think about it that way as well. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think um, uh, where I was going to go is, is some people just don't have extremely mobile hips. Um, most of the time, we kind of know if this is the truth or not. If it's like, say, I hurt my back, all of a sudden my hips aren't mobile, then it's probably, you probably have the mobility. It's just, it's just protectively not there right now, which is not a problem. It, it will come back. Um, but a lot of times people will search, that they'll, they'll go down the, the, the route of looking for like hip flexor stretches and things of that nature, which um, it doesn't always last. Sometimes it's helpful. Again, use the two week rule roughly. But um, what I experience, what I see with some people that have groin pain in the front, again, it can be that wrapping experience, but also too, if they feel like they really have that butt out, like archy back type of thing, because it makes their back feel good in a lift. This also dumps a lot of compression into the front part of the hip, creating something called femoral acetabular impingement or FAI, which normally FAI can reduce itself after you stop the back thing because the back can settle itself. Um, but um, this is this is a situation where like, I know that people wanted to come to a lot of our webinars are like, oh, I have all of those. It's like, if you, if you find the one thing, uh, most of your stuff will go away. Uh, and I like to consider it like mud in a cup, you shook it up. Once you let it settle, you'll see clearly what is left. And a lot of times it's not much that's left, but if you start chasing everything in the dark without settling the main thing, then it's going to be very frustrating, probably. Um, okay. Um, do you believe that the pose running method is helpful for weak, injured backs? I'll take this one. Um, it, I wouldn't say it's necessarily the thing I would go for to treat a low back. Um, I think everybody has their own way of running that works for them. And it's actually, in my, in my experience, it's really hard to train gait. It takes a long time. It's like trying to train somebody out of a limp. However, something to consider if you are training gait is that um, I, like we've had people call before where they're like, you know what, I really want to gait analysis. And it's like, why? It's because my back hurts and my hips are hiking when I'm running. And it's like, well, then let's just work on your back. You know, let's, let's get your back to feel better. And they're like, well, but what about the hip hiking? And I, I explained them the mud settling. A lot of the mobility issues and tightness issues and movement compensations that they're experiencing that we're going to find in that running analysis can simply be settled by taking the, taking the problem away, taking the main pain source away. Um, so I, I, I don't necessarily go down the route of suggesting running methods because we're not running coaches. We mainly get people to the point where they feel better and they have nice support. And then if they want to choose a uh, pose method and they have no pain with it, by all means. But I know other people like chi running and all that kind of stuff too. Um, I don't have a problem with any of it, but it should feel like it fits you well. It shouldn't feel painful to run. So if you feel like you're running fluidly, by all means, you can do pose method, but I wouldn't choose it as a treatment type. Um, okay, uh, Don, if those movements helped me with my lower back that we did, how long should I keep doing them before I do strengthening? That's a good question. Mm, I don't, so let me caution you, Don, you can't got, you, we can't treat anybody on this. <laughs> that is a good question, but it's extremely focal. Well, then I don't know how to answer it. <laughs> I, don't know how to answer I would it. say, I would say, listen to your body. Um, normally, what we see is we usually do it for a few days, um, but you have to try to listen to your body and see to yourself, okay, I'm going to do this and it helped, but it reduced it a little bit. So maybe tomorrow I'm going to do it some more all throughout the day. And it's reduced it more. So maybe just do it until you feel like, hey, I feel like this is really, really helping. Now I'm not really having pain anymore. Um, and then I can continue moving forward with my strength training. This is, this is just, my advice would be listen to your own body. You know yourself best. Um, and if you want a little more guidance, like I said, we have options and programs available to help you with that as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's something, sorry, we're... We're trying to stay within our parameters of what we can and can't say. I hope you understand that part. Um, because if we start giving actually direct focal guidance, then we're, we're kind of going to be shooting ourselves in the foot. But um, it, it won't take that long. Okay. So um, 
but we really do. The reason why we put those programs together is to make sure that we don't shoot ourselves in the foot, but everybody still gets the, the answers that they need. All right. So I think that if, if that did work with you, you should really do that, that call with, with us. I think that will greatly benefit you. Um, okay. And so uh, we had a question on the side, hip hiking, hip hiking or hip, sorry, I meant hip drop. Hip drop is like when your pelvis drops with running. So I guess the other side would be a hip hike. Um, hip hike would be really painful, but hip drop, which if you look, Google that, you'll see a bunch of other things that say are related to running injuries um, in relationship hip drop. Um, but there's other things going on too. Yep, no problem. Okay, uh, I've had an epidural shot in my lower back, L3 and 4. Should I prepare myself? Or should I prepare myself that that's a temporary fix? Yes or no? You want it done or me? Should I prepare myself that that's a temporary fix? So when I think about epidural shots, I think about it as a way, it's, it's kind of like a Band-Aid. It's not necessarily fixing the issue. So let's think about epidural shots as a way of kind of just decreasing pain temporarily, sure. But if we continue to do the movements or the things that cause that pain in the first place, it's going to return. So is the epidural shot temporary? I, I mean, my answer would, that to be, would be yes. I couldn't tell you exactly how long. Um, but we have to go to the core source of what was causing that pain in the first place. Yeah, yeah. It's, and there's nothing wrong with doing some of these uh, injection and medicative inter and interventions, by the way. There's a time and place we've sent people to them as well. Um, but just knowing what's driving the problem uh, and take those mechanics away if we can, it should certainly make it so these things slow down the progression of it keep flaring up over and over again. Okay, our last question, by the way, if you want to get your questions in, this is the last one. So we're going to end after this unless we hear it from somebody else. So post L5 S1 microdisectomy 20 years ago, haven't been able to run for about three years due to burning in the right thigh super tight quads and uh, hips and quads i've done active release and other extremely painful therapies to, to no available i've had active relief that was actually what i did when i was 15 too and so i agree with you it is a little bit painful helpful at that time though uh i do boot camps regularly for exercise but i but only want to get back to running really bad mainly for mental health what do i do you want this one down or me go ahead Okay. So, um, I'd say that, let's see, let me read through this. Um, uh, so boot camps. I like to address probably the idea of boot camps on this. And, and, uh, I think by the way, I think it's, it's great that you're, you know, realize that why you use running. Some people use running for all these different reasons, um, cardiovascular fitness and so on, which you can, but sometimes it's really nice just to admit that I need, I need space and time for myself. And so, um, for that, for that reason, I think getting back to running is actually a really good goal for you. But with the boot camps, it's important to note on this. And we had a patient recently who um, she she was trying to lose weight, and so she really wanted she was doing boot camps. And so I usually have no problem with boot camps, but she she said my back hurts and I need to get back to boot camp. And I said why? And she's like for the weight loss and so on. And I said you know there's a quicker way to lose weight. It's just in the kitchen, you know. And so if that doesn't accomplish her goal. We've already X'd out um, a driver of her problem because in boot camp, there's a lot of quote unquote power movements. I know they're body weight, but they're quick, they're powerful. You're rowing on uh, rowers, you're doing burpees, you're doing box jumps, which includes a lot of movements that sometimes bother people. So it's hard to put out a fire if someone keeps putting fuel on it. So if something like boot camp is, bo is bothering you, but you want to get back to running, boot camp won't necessarily always tie that tie those two goals together. But I bet walking could, at least as an easy start. And you'd also get outside, you might feel better, mental health and so on. Um, so that's, um, that's, may, that's maybe something that you would consider. But if you've tried all these other things like active release and um, things of that nature, and it hasn't worked, again, think of just think outside the box and think of things you have not done yet. And some of the stuff that we did today are some of the easiest wins that we have people do when we when we see them for the first time and if it works most people say oh, i've never tried that but you know that one frog one it doesn't feel like i'm doing anything shouldn't i be doing something no you should be doing what works for you 
if your movement got better and you feel better, you do what works for you. It doesn't have to feel painful. It doesn't have to feel stretchy and so on. So um, I think that's the last question. So if everybody is, um, again, take advantage of that call. Um, you can ask us some of these questions in person and we'd love to see you move. Uh, and we'd love to see that you guys find an answer to your problems. Um, Don, you want to close it up? Sure. Yeah, I think that this went really well. I liked all the questions and I hope that everybody got their questions answered and just reach out to us. I think that, I mean, I'm super excited about the programs that we've been putting together. It's been really working for people. And so I hope that some of you reach out just to get to know a little bit more because I'm excited about it. And I'm sure you are too, Seb. I am. Yeah. I think it's a good thing. I think people have been really happy about it so far. And, you know, I don't think we've had a single complaint yet, have we? No, definitely <laughs> not. So thanks for coming guys. And I hope that this was helpful and uh, we will hopefully talk to you soon. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Cool. All right. Bye guys. Bye.